Hello YouTube. So I thought I would tell you the story of my philosophical development, where I started and how I got to where I am now. Because a lot of people have asked me over the years uh, about, you know, changes in my views and, and you know, what the, my history is. And uh, I'm never any good at answering that question because I don't have a very good memory. But I decided to sit down and made some notes. And so, uh, yeah, this is, um, this is the story, as best I remember it, of uh, the changes in my views over time. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I, I never had that much of an interest in philosophy uh, as a kid, or even for much of my time as a teenager, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I think that it was only really when I was thinking of what to do at university that I ultimately decided on philosophy. And I think that was in itself kind of a, um, well, that was just kind of luck. I just happened to, to choose that. I can't remember why I chose it. There might have been, there might have been more to it than that. I, 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 I seem to recall uh, that, you know, I did have an interest in uh, philosophy of mind related topics. I seem to remember reading um, Dan Dennett's Consciousness Explained, like, bef like when I was like maybe 16, 17. So I, I was aware of philosophy before then. Um, and for some reason, I chose to do it at university. Um, now, I, when I first went to university, I didn't stay there long because I, I, I kind of had a breakdown. I mean, I, uh, I, I had really, really serious anxiety, panic attacks every day. Um, I had to come home and I carried on uh, doing philosophy because, you know, by this point I did, a, uh, I did like about a month at university, I think, and uh, I had to come home, but I'd, I'd been hooked by then. So uh, at this point, I'm just... I'm just doing it on my own. It was around this time that I started the YouTube channel. Um, obviously, uh, I wasn't um, able to uh, do the subject in the normal way. Um, so the YouTube channel gave me a way uh, of continuing to learn this with some sort of formal structure, you know, because I was making, had to make videos, which means obviously if I'm teaching stuff to other people, I have to learn it myself. So the YouTube channel was always really useful for that, um, for that reason. And actually many, many of my early videos were made um, while I was still at home, uh, while, I was, while I still had these problems. Eventually, of course, I got over them. Um, and luckily I've been over them for many years now. Um, and I went back to university and so I, I suppose that's, you know, that's where it, it all really kicks off properly, right? Um, my main interest uh, was always philosophy of science. I was particularly interested in philosophy of biology. I don't remember much about the development in my views when I was an undergrad, but I know that I was, I was, I was a scientific realist. I was a naturalist. I guess I had sort of empiricist inclinations, but you know, I wasn't particularly hardcore about it. It's just you know, I tended more to the empiricist side. So I know, for instance, that I was always uh, a moral anti-realist. Um, I always, I was also attracted to more sort of anti-realist accounts of the ontology of mathematics. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, that was just my inclination, right? Um, <laughs> actually, the ontology of mathematics is maybe a bad one uh, as an example to choose because I've I've never done any uh, kind of formal work in that. Like I never did a course in philosophy of mathematics. But the, my point is my inclination um, tended to more sort of anti-realist accounts. But when it came to um, science, uh, I was a scientific realist. And I, I would have considered myself a physicalist, materialist, um, some sort of naturalist, uh, certainly. Now, uh, the end of my undergrad obviously had my dissertation. And for my dissertation, I did it on the no miracles argument, which is, of course, the central argument for realism. Um, it sometimes feels like that might be the only argument for realism. Well, of course it isn't, right? There are, there are other arguments for realism. But uh, it, you know, that kind of argument, that uh, inference from success to truth, plays such a huge role in the, uh, in the realism debate that, uh, you know, that, that sometimes, it sometimes feels like that's ultimately what it all boils down to. Um, and I went into that dissertation intending to defend the argument, and I couldn't do it. Um, I ended up, uh, over the course of, of the, the year that I was writing it, I, I, I just uh, lost my belief in it. It, it, it stopped be, being convincing to me. And, you know, that, that left me 
uh, in uh, a bit of a bit of a pickle because the thing is, is that at this point, like, I could no longer uh, consider myself a realist, right? Like, my main reason for being a realist um, was that I was so impressed by the remarkable success of science, and it seemed like um, the truth of our best theories was the best explanation for the remarkable success of those theories. You know, I mean, that, that was the kind of line I, I went for. Um, but I'd now lost my belief in that for various reasons. And the reason why this is a problem is that so much of my other philosophical views depended on realism. Um, like, uh, there, there are so many philosophical topics, right, where it really matters what line you take on the realism, anti-realism thing. Um, I mean, especially when it comes to, you know, um, like if you, if you think about, say, um, philosophy of biology, which I was quite interested in at the time, you know, questions about like the units of selection or like the nature of species, or, you know, all, all of these things. Um, like it, in order to, so it seems like a lot of my views in, in that respect were resting on a, a prior assumption of realism. Um, you know, similarly in, in like metaphysics in general, insofar as I thought metaphysics was uh, a, a useful field to engage in, right? Um, my thought was, well, metaphysics has to be based, it has to kind of build on science, right? Science is, um, science provides uh, our best way of learning about the nature of the world. So if you're going to do metaphysics, right, it should be a kind of scientific metaphysics, or it should be a naturalistic metaphysics. Um, once you give up scientific realism, it looks like you've got to then give up metaphysics. Um, so, uh, so many of the things that I was interested in just, you know, were out, right? Now then, um, during my master's course, I, I think it was at this time when I did my master's, this is one year, the master's is one year, my undergrad was three years, master's is one year. So during this one year, I was a bit lost. I did my dissertation at the time on idealization as a challenge to scientific realism. And I have uh, a video on that in my scientific realism series. So, um, you know, the, uh, the sort of argument that I developed is available. You can go and, you can go and see that argument. Um, but of course, this was just sort of providing more ammunition against the realist. I still didn't have a clear position of my own at this time. Um, and I think, yeah, over time, I just started drifting more and more towards empiricism or some sort of empiricism. And what I found particularly attractive about empiricism is that empiricism, um, as a philosophical program, one of the things that um, you can do like within an empiricist framework is account for uh, various successful discourses without appealing to the truth of those discourses. So, you know, you, you account for the success of a particular form of discourse uh, without postulating entities beyond what impinges on experience that the discourse correctly describes. So, um, you know, that's the, the sort of general philosophical program. And, you know, if you think about it in the context of, you know, mathematics, right, so we account for the success of mathematics without um, postulating kind of abstract mathematical entities. We account for the success or the use of moral language without uh, postulating moral values, moral properties, anything like that. You know, we account for the success of uh, modal discourse, you know, talk of possibility and necessity and contingency without postulating um, possible worlds or without supposing that, um, that the discourse correctly describes the nature of entities beyond what impinges on experience. And so, you know, you then apply the same thing in the case of the sciences. Um, like science, we can account for the uh, success and power of science, right, without postulating uh, entities uh, or without sort of postulating some structure or entities beyond experience, which scientific theories correctly describe. Okay, so I now drifted firmly towards empiricism and I found that very attractive. Um, now, I should also say that in the background, f through all of this, um, like even, I think, even before I went to university, so um, not the first time, but, you know, it, uh, it, so when I went to university the first time, I then came home, and when I was home, um, I read Against Method by Paul Firebend, and it was lightning. It was like, just boom. You know, it just it just struck me I, because everything I'd heard about Firebend 
before reading him had maybe think like, oh yeah, you know, this, this guy is like, um, the, the, the reputation that Firebend had was that he was the worst enemy of science. There's actually a book called The Worst Enemy of Science, question mark, uh, which is about Paul Firebend because he had been called the worst enemy of science. And so, you know, Firebend has a kind of reputation and I thought I was going to, I thought I was going to read this and it would be ridiculous and easy to um, refute. And actually Firebend, I think the very first thing I did read by Firebend was an article he wrote called How to Defend Society Against Science, which is kind of a, it's not a very good article. It's, it's one of his lesser works and that was quite easy to, uh, you know, as, as a, you know, sort of pro-science, uh, scientistic sort of scientifically inclined person. It was kind of easy to respond to that. But um, you know, I, I read against method, and it was it was it was just striking. I mean, it um, it really changed the whole way I, I, I thought about philosophy and um, and philosophy of science and science and and um, I was still a, at the time that I read it. You know, I was still a realist, um, but it. It changed the character of my realism quite significantly. I should also say um, Paul Churchland, um, very pro-science, uh, very much a scientific realist, very materialist. Um, he's heavily influenced by Paul Firebend as well. Um, so, you know, Fi Firebend has uh, some interesting, you know, the, 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 there are interesting influences. Um, but anyway, right, so in the background to all this, um, I'm a big fan of Firebend. And one of the things that I think uh, became increasingly appealing about Firebend was Firebend's challenge to the notion of rules of reason, right? Um, it's, it's Firebend's idea that there, well, as he says, you know, there is no scientific method, but more generally, they're just like, there, there are no rules of rationality. Any, any rule that you propose can be broken in the name of progress. Any rule can in principle be broken and in such a way as to improve our knowledge. Um, you know, counter induction can be an acceptable thing to do. Uh, even, you know, the laws of logic are not universal. And um, at the same time, of course, I was also uh, reading about dialetheism and, you know, Graham Priest and, and that whole crowd. So, you know, I, I had sort of the, the firebend challenging the idea of rules of reason. And at the same time, I'm also reading about people who have actually constructed alternatives to what we would perhaps naturally think of as the rules of reason, you know, in insofar as uh, dialetheism and paraconsistent logic provide a challenge to classical logic. Um, okay, so, <laughs> so then, all of this is going on, I'm in my master's course, and um, for my PhD, my initial idea was to figure out a way of combining my empiricism my increasingly hardcore empiricism with a sort of Firebendian approach to epistemology. And, and in particular, I sort of wanted to, to mash David Hume and Paul Firebend together. Um, you know, because Hume has, I think, some, th th there are similar points being made, right? Like Hume also raises challenges to, yeah, to, to reason in, in a kind of similar way. To, so maybe not kind of similar, but you know, Hume, what you get in Hume is this idea that uh, reason alone, so Hume's view is going to be that reason alone is destructive, right? The application of reason alone will lead to a total suspension of judgment. Um, and uh, I mean, obviously that would be completely paralyzing, right? That's not how human, human minds actually work. We don't just suspend judgment on everything. So what actually happens is non-rational factors have to intervene. Um, but the, I mean, the assumption that Hume seems to be making here is that there are rules of rationality, right? That, um, you know, rational belief is all and only those beliefs produced by the proper application of the rules of rationality. And then the problem is, is that rules of rationality, when they are um, just applied without any constraint, um, lead you uh, uh, to total suspension of judgment. But that's an unacceptable that's an unacceptable place to end, place to land. So, you know, non-rational factors intervene. But the other way to look at this kind of point is to say, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it, it, the idea, the very idea that like the application of reason could lead to total suspension of judgment. That's just, that's, there's something almost conceptually incoherent about that because 
um, it would it, because that's sort of self-sabotaging, right? If you just have no beliefs about the world at all, if, if there's just no way that you have of making assumptions um, or you know holding beliefs about the way that things will be, if you, if you don't hold any um, representation of the world, then there's no way to act anymore. So it's self-sabotaging. Um, so you know, reason can't be that way. So you know you can sort of say that the, the mistake that Hume made was to think of reason in terms of rules of reason. What he should have done is gotten rid of the idea of rules of reason. You know, rather than say um, there are rules of reason and we need non-rational factors to intervene, it should have been, no, right, the problem is with the rules of reason. Anyway, the, the point of all of this is that I was interested in kind of mashing together David Hume and Paul Firebend. But then, then, then I read a bit more of uh, the work of Baz van Frassen, or based van Frassen, as I like to call him. Um, yeah, van Frassen is really, really cool, but here's the problem. Here's the problem with van Frassen. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think van Frassen had already, had already sort of done it, or at least as far as I was concerned at the time. Uh, it seemed to me when I, you know, when I was reading van Frassen's work on broader epistemology, that he'd sort of already combined empiricism and firebend in his uh, voluntarist epistemology. Now, I don't know whether Van Frassen himself conceives of his uh, view this way. I, I've not seen other people interpret Van Frassen this way, but that's how it appears to me, right? Um, the basic, so, so I, I'm actually doing a video right now where I'm, I'm beginning to write the script for a video on Van Frassen's voluntarist epistemology and uh, related ideas. And um, it's not going to be specifically about Van Frassen, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be in that sort of area. Um, but anyway, the basic idea is that uh, the, the set of beliefs of a rational agent must be such that they do not sabotage their own possibility of vindication. Um, so, you know, if a belief generates a contradiction, or if a set of beliefs is contradictory, that sabotages its own possibility of vindication insofar as two of those, you know, like both of those beliefs cannot be true, right? Um, again, we're putting aside things like dialetheism here. Um, um, or, I mean, so for, for, for Van Frassen, um, the set of beliefs has to be logically consistent and it has to be probabilistically coherent. Um, it has to conform to the rules of probability theory, otherwise um, it becomes vulnerable to Dutch books and you have engaged in self-sabotage. Um, but beyond this constraint, from Van Frassen's point of view, any belief at all is rationally permissible. Um, and in particular, what Van Frassen does is uh, reject, the, uh, reject the idea that well, I guess he's, he's basically rejecting the idea that beliefs require a justification, right? For, for, so for Van Fressen, there is nothing irrational about, um, you know, making an ampliative inference to the future, um, nor is there anything, you know, irrational about resisting it. There's nothing irrational about, you know, making inferences um, without justification, right? Um, there is uh, no algorithm for rational belief, provided uh, your set of beliefs do not... Um, are not self-sabotaging, provided the set of beliefs do not vindicate their, um, do not sabotage their own possibility of vindication. Um, okay, as I said, maybe that didn't make any sense. I'm doing a video on it. Don't worry, we'll come back to this at some point in the future when that video is done. Who knows when that will be, but I'll come back to this. Um, but the point is, is that as I saw it, uh, Van Frassen had had combined Hume and Firebend. He'd combined their insights in a, in a remarkable way um, and in a way that I didn't really agree with. So Van Frassen still endorses, um, you know, logical consistency. Um, so he still thinks that there are, in a sense, rules of reason, um, logical consistency and probabilistic coherence. Um, I don't do that. And so in some ways I'm more radical than Van Frassen, although in some ways less radical. That will come out in the video that I've got planned. But the point is, you know, regardless of whether I, regardless of the points of disagreement, it was quite clear that Van Frassen had combined human firebend and he had done it in a way that was much, much more sophisticated than I would ever be able to uh, come anywhere near to in my own work. So I just thought, well, I'm not going to pursue this. I'm going to do something different. Um, and so I decided to do my PhD on uh, a view called perspectivism, which was developed by a guy called Ron Gieri. Um, I've done various videos exploring the relevant ideas here. Um, basic idea of perspectivism tries to account for scientific knowledge as um, an interaction between uh, scientists and the world. It takes it that 
um, scientific knowledge. You know, we, we have access to the world, we have scientific knowledge, but it's always dependent on perspective. Now, in the course of my PhD, I have drifted to, um, I, I would say, just a straightforwardly uh, relativist, uh, constructivist position. Um, the truth of any claim is always evaluated from a particular perspective and there is no uh, neutral standpoint. There is no uh, perspective independent means of evaluating any uh, any truth claim. Um, so perspectives provide, uh, first of all, a means of evaluating truth. They provide uh, the standards by which we evaluate truth claims. And this is important because any claim that we make um, always involves some sort of uh, simplification. You know, the classic example is if I say the table is flat. Well, you know, the table isn't perfectly flat, right? How, like, the, the table needs to be flat enough for our purposes. Um, and so the table in front of me, I call it flat because what I need is to put objects on it in such a way that they don't fall off or wobble. And, okay, the table is flat. If I was conducting a precision experiment in physics, then I, I, I would not say that it's flat. Um, so uh, for one thing perspectives provide is, again, sort of standards and means of evaluation. Another thing that perspectives provide is a kind of taxonomy or conceptual scheme, a way of carving up the world. Um, and, then, and with a taxonomy in place, you can then make true statements like within that taxonomy. Uh, so again, simple example, but uh, color, right? Um, I don't think that colors are in any sense like natural kinds. And of course, um, colors uh, exhibit, you know, there's, there's no sort of distinctness between colors. There's just this kind of spectrum, right? It, it gradually moves from, from red to orange to yellow. And there's, there's no distinct, it's like, it's not like this set is red. Um, one of the things that we do is, you know, we take this and we, we carve it up. And so I can say, you know, grass is green or the sky is blue. And those are true um, given a certain way of, you know, given this taxonomy that we're assuming, given this taxonomy or this kind of classification scheme, right, that we have imposed upon experience, we can say that that's true. Um, but in any context, there are always going to be multiple acceptable taxonomies. None of them are perfect. And, you know, the right taxonomy depends on, um, it, it's, it's, it's a matter of like pragmatic evaluation. Obviously, lots of different people around the world have uh, divided up color space in very different ways. And um, generally speaking, you know, uh, those different ways of dividing up color space seem to work pretty well for all of us. Um, so anyway, um, I, I, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking very briefly here. Uh, for more on this particular idea, see my video, Classification and Kinds, an Anti-Realist View. Okay, so I think, I think that's the story. I think that's the story of how I started and how I got to where I am today. And um, who knows uh, where it will go from here, but um, yep, that's it. Bye.